Hey guys, just before the video starts, we're going to be hosting a composition challenge in the Squash Discord starting today. So if you'd like to participate or just chat with the community, I'll leave in the link in the description. Studio One has a weird story. It's one of the newest professional grade programs in terms of audio workstations and has a long history of development with a bunch of different people from other companies that you might know. It's even newer than Reaper, which came out three years before it. Studio One is most certainly one of my favorite looking pieces of software with a much more muted approach to its design. It takes the route of having a much more flattened look like Ableton does, but doesn't go overboard making it look like MS Paint. Sorry Ableton users, it had to be said. We still love all different DAW users here in the Squash community though. Anyways, its history dates back all the way to 1999 with the precursor to Studio One being the Crystal Audio Engine. Let's take a closer look at how Crystal turned into Studio One and a brief dive into the history of the creator. The Crystal Audio Engine was a thesis project by Matthias Juan and was in my opinion one of the coolest looking programs of its time. It's pretty baller to create an entire DAW as a college project and having made it free to use for everyone. The original program was spelled with a C instead of a K, but that name was already taken, so in 2003 he changed the name to start with a K. The newer 2003 version had other contributors, many of whom Matthias never met in person, who helped him develop some of the stock plugins that came with Crystal. Looking through the creatives blog, which is the developer name Matthias used, the response to the program at the time was overwhelmingly positive. It had a perfectly flat playlist similar to that of Pro Tools or Ableton and had a detached mixer much like FL Studio. Not to mention that at the time there was basically no freeware capable of multi-track recording for the Windows platform making it a perfect jumping off point for a newcomer. Something Matthias mentioned was that musicians both approved and disliked the fact that it was limited to only 16 tracks. Kind of laughable by today's standards, but was totally workable for the time, and musicians even said it gave them a more creative challenge to problem solve around that limitation making them think of things they wouldn't have otherwise. The inspiration for the project came from his self-described arrogance when using the newly minted Cubase 3.5 thinking to himself, I can do better. To be fair to him, it is a daunting challenge to create a program of this magnitude. He created his own framework in the C++ language called CCL which allowed him to differentiate the look of the program from the default Windows interface look. When he released this version of the software, he gained over a thousand downloads in less than a few days which was superb for such a small project. Since Crystal was a university student's project, it did have some bugs like not recognizing certain VSTs, but regardless, it was impressive for its time period, and the fact that it was developed by a college student, we can excuse these early issues. Its primary window is the mixer, however it had separate windows for sequencing and live recording. It even had a decent amount of built-in classic plugins like EQ, Delay, and Reverb, and it even supported third-party VSTs. Its only real downfall is the fact that it did not support MIDI, which is pretty much a standard feature nowadays. I found it nearly impossible to find a lot of info about versions of this software searching through old forums, Matthias' website, and internet archive unfortunately, so if you've used it during its time or have any extra little nuggets of information, please let us know in the comments. Sadly, licensing for the program was discontinued in 2019 and you can no longer download it from their website, which is a shame as it was a nifty free program. Moving on to Matthias himself, he attended an Austrian vocational school named Messinger Strasse, located in Klagenfurt, Austria. He went there to study engineering, and this was where he'd create the first version of the Crystal Audio Engine spelled with a C, and later in 2003 create the final version. In 2000, after graduating, he also started working for Steinberg, who makes Cubase and the VST platform, which will come into play later on. He then transitioned to working at Presonus, which is the company that would eventually take over development on the first version of Studio One. Matthias started working on Studio One under the codename K2 just after the Crystal Audio Engine came out in 2004. Now, here is where Presonus and Steinberg come in, as this venture became a joint development process in 2006 when Presonus started working with Crystal Lab Software to create this product. Crystal Lab Software was the startup that Matthias and another former Steinberg employee named Wolfgang Kundras started after they'd left Steinberg. Now, to understand how this acquisition happened, we should dive into how Presonus came to be and how they went from a company ran out of a guy's garage to one of the leading companies inside the music production industry. Presonus was started by a guy named Jim Odom, as well as Brian Smith in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
Jim Odom's backstory is pretty wild, starting off with his attendance at the Berklee College of Music in 1979 studying jazz guitar. He attended this school off of a scholarship he got from Downbeat Magazine founded over 80 years ago dedicated to jazz music but has since expanded into broader topics. He later attended Louisiana State University in 1985 studying computer engineering and would go on to graduate school at the Investment Banking Institute in New York. My man has studied a wild array of disciplines and topics, but it seemed like he was always destined to end up in the music industry considering his background before college. In an interview he did with Tape Op Magazine, he stated that it all started with him being 18 years old and converting a barn into a studio and letting people record in it for free. After he attended the Berklee College of Music, he became a member of a band called The Rue, which was signed to Capitol Records and toured the country. On the side, he mentioned he'd worked at a music studio called Studio in the Country in Louisiana, which is where they ended up recording a lot of their music. He worked with tons of talented artists and engineers, and clearly had a deep appreciation for the music scene, and it was almost obvious he was going to end up doing great things within that industry. In 1985, he moved to Los Angeles to do audio engineering at Capitol Records Studios for different people, but eventually moved back to his hometown where he built his own studio called Technosound. Eventually, he stopped working in the studio space and would go back to college at LSU like I mentioned before. This college stint would be where he truly found his calling and was studying digital signal processing which would plant the seed for his eventual founding of Presonus in 1995. However, before this happened, he had a brief but interesting career working for the Navy designing sonar systems. Yeah, as you can tell, this dude has pretty much done it all, and to this day he's still working on different projects. Now, moving on to how Presonus came to be, around 1993 he started developing a product that he called the DCP-8. He would later unveil this project at the NAM show, which is the National Association of Music Merchants. Basically, a bunch of really smart nerds get together to show off their newest music tech, devices, and instruments, and it's f***ing awesome. Now, Presonus would later go on to create basically the same product except with a bunch of analog controls for engineers and studios called the ACP-8 with 64 knobs on the control panel. That was the product that truly kickstarted Presonus as they sold a f ton of them to studios. These devices would win numerous awards at the NAMM show, and we wouldn't be where we are today with Studio One without these products. Presonus would also go on to create other hardware products like a microphone preamplifier as well as multiple Firewire based audio interfaces. But the real icing on the cake here was the joining of Crystal Labs software and Presonus in 2006 which we covered briefly earlier. This only happened because Presonus during a visit to Germany ran into some developers and one of those developers would be none other than Matthias. Matthias already wanted to create a software company beyond the Crystal Audio Engine, and Jim Odom amongst other partners at Presonus saw the potential in this. This one event was the catalyst for the Studio One DAW that we know today being created. However, while the Studio One DAW was underway, Presonus would launch a few different products. One of which being the AudioBox USB and MIDI interface, which was sadly discontinued later. On top of that, they'd released Studio Live, which was their series of digital mixers that were meant for smaller scale projects like club shows. And now we arrive in 2009, which was a big year for the company, and in April of 2009, they'd announced Studio One at a fair in Germany. Only a short while after the announcement in September of 2009, the first version of Studio One was finally here. The first version was pretty damn impressive, even being relatively late to the party in terms of workstations with unlimited tracks and even came stock with 27 different plugins to work with. This was absurd at the time, as workstations previous to this were way behind in terms of offering this many plugins to work with. Unlike nowadays, where certain workstations can come with 50 or even 100 plugins to start with. I actually watched a video by Direct Productions in preparation for writing this video script and they have a great video that goes into detail about Studio One as well, so please check it out if you're interested, I'll leave the link in the description. Anyways, another big piece to the puzzle of Studio One's explosive success was the fact that it came out working on both Mac and PC from its inception. This was not exactly common at the time. Looking at you ImageLine, it only took you 20 years to create a Mac version. It's okay, we still love you. The team working on Studio One was stacked, as Wolfgang was one of the original developers for the Cubase workstation and Matthias had not only created a DAW for his thesis but also worked on the specification for the VST platform. Also, since it was released so late in the scope of workstation history, its interface started off as very modern and generally good looking in my opinion. Things only got better and better as time went on though and in October of 2011 version 2 would come around. 
Probably the best part about this update was that Studio One now had Celimony Melodyne integration, which is basically the professional gold standard for pitch correction. Pretty much all pop artists have this plugin on their vocal chains or something similar, so it was a great addition to have. Now, the reason that Melodyne came along here was the fact that they created something called the Audio Random Access extension, which allowed third-party plugins to essentially look as if they were integrated directly into Studio One. We'd also see quantization and transient detection for audio samples, which is an absolute godsend and necessary in my opinion in the modern day. One other thing I forgot to mention here is that if you were in the market for an audio interface and wanted to use Studio One, you got a free copy of the software with any purchase of a PreSonus interface. Now, from the start of Studio One's release, this workstation was beloved by its users, and after using the demo they provide on their site, I understand completely why. The other nice thing about this software that I learned from Direct was the fact that basically every single function within the program was drag and drop compatible, which if you produce music, you'll know how absolutely goaded that functionality is as it speeds up your workflow. In the coming years, we'd see an interface makeover in 2015, making the elements more flat and modern, as well as darker, which I'm always a fan of. Something I'd noticed here as well is that their interface design resembled the skylight design of Sonar X1's layout, which takes a single window approach so that you don't have tons of different windows layered on top of each other. We'd also see a new approach to their arrangement window here as well, allowing you to move and copy entire sections directly in their arrangement page. Studio One had proved that even though they were a new company, that didn't mean their software was not polished or professional and then continued to see success into the future. Now we arrive in the modern day where the last few updates of Studio One were each better than the last. In 2018, they announced version 4 on a YouTube livestream, and one of the big new features was a chord track. It allowed chord transposing as well as suggested substitution options if you were having writer's block, which is always a welcome addition. We got a fancy new drum interface as well as new input gain staging capabilities on the mixer. I think it's safe to say that Studio One had not only caught up to its competitors at this point, but had surpassed them in many ways. Version 3 was much more of a nitty gritty feature update where the program got smoother, faster, and simply better overall. Version 4, however, like I mentioned above with the chord track, was aimed at giving engineers and producers tools to more easily get their ideas from their head to the program. On the plugin side, we see updates to both of the sample editors in Studio One called Impact and Sample One. With the final two versions of Studio One, we'd see a few more nifty upgrades like the mixer scenes, which I desperately wish was a thing in more programs. You essentially get to save a snapshot of your entire mixer window to load at any time, which removed the need to create project templates for mixer presets. Something I definitely don't use as much as I'm not that great at reading music was the new score view, but nonetheless, I assume it's a welcome addition for musicians who use it. Another niche but most certainly cool feature is the fact that you could write lyrics down in their lyric engine to be displayed directly onto your tracks. By version 6, it was clear this program was here to stay, and I'm glad it's an option out there for people to use. Thank you to the viewers who suggested this as a video topic, as reading about the precursors to Studio One, as well as tinkering with the modern program myself, was a pleasure to you. I hope you guys enjoyed going through the history of this program with me and learned a thing or two. Thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.